Hey guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is Mark Ellis. Welcome one and all to the best movie news show in the entire galaxy. My name is Mark Ellis, and on today's show, we're counting down our favorite movies of the entire summer, plus an old vampire is going to make a new return, and we celebrate the best news of the day. Movie Pass is now like $10, according oh. to some. Some sources. <laughs> also, here is T. Hey, everybody, it's T from Cinefix. Happy to be back here with you guys today. Also, here, Perry Nemiroff. Hi, guys. Happy Tuesday. I like applesauce. Wow. <laughs> also, here, Christian Harloff. You plagiarize. <laughs> you plagiarize. <laughs> I was waiting for your response. You guys should know that applesauce is one of Christian Harloff's favorite mic check words <laughs> ever. <laughs> what a what is it about applesauce? Bro, yeah, it's just a stupid word, but the fact that Perry Nemiroff, my friend, <laughs> My mm -hmm. New York confidant, yeah. you little thief, Fredo, you. Let me get I had to give it a little credit. Back, Thank you. Unbelievable. Give it back to you. <laughs> What's All next? Right, Someone going to start singing Shoes and Beef? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't take Shoes and Beef. That's his baby carrots. Well, we have a fun show to you for you guys. What? We have a fun show for you guys today. But we are going to kick off with some very tragic news that happened on the set of Deadpool Two very recently. Ashley Mova, what's the story? Tragic news coming out of the filming of Deadpool 2. Early Monday morning, a stunt person identified as Joy S.J. Harris was killed on the set after a trick involving a motorcycle went wrong. Deadline reports that she was the first African-American female professional road racer and that Deadpool 2 was her first movie as a stunt performer. Reports state that before the accident, she had successfully pulled off the stunt five times and practiced all day on Saturday. But on the final take, the accident occurred. Star Ryan Reynolds took to social media yesterday to share his thoughts on the tragedy, saying... Today, we tragically lost a member of our crew while filming Deadpool. We're heartbroken, shocked, and devastated, but recognize nothing can com come close to the grief and inexplicable pain her family and loved ones must feel at this moment. My heart pours out to them, along with each and every person she touched in this world. Yeah, it's just one of the saddest things you could possibly hear is something like this, a tragedy made in the name of entertainment for all of us. And there's been times in the history of cinema when you have a tragedy happen on set. And for somebody like me, and I'm sure a lot of you guys, it seems almost impossible to separate that even when the movie comes out, whether it was with The Crow, with Brandon Lee's accent, or it was something where a stunt person lost their life, like recently in The Expendables 2. It just, it, now this movie will forever be known for a lot of things, probably, but also this. And Joy, in particular, was a pioneer in the world of stunts. I mean, she was the first African-American road racer and to be in a movie as huge as Deadpool, it's such a boon for her career and it's just such a tragic loss that you read about and you just wish that you could go back and my heart does go out to her family and her friends and I know that a lot of times when you make a movie, Christian, that crew becomes like your family for a period of time and with somebody like David Leach directing who has a background in stunts and stunt coordination, I know how valued he holds everybody in that community, and this is just such a um, such a sad day for everybody involved. It's terrible, and I think that the 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 response that they put out and that Ryan Reynolds put it out was first of all very was well said, well done, and he's right though it's it's the family that's going to really be impacted by it, and they're going to need their time to really um, to process this because it's it's horrible because you know that the passion alone that goes into making a film, but when you watch uh, uh, the stunt people talk about their work and what they do. They are some of the most passionate people out there, and you're absolutely right with the director. The, the fact that what he has done in the past with John Wick and, and with Atomic Blonde, and then you see, you know that this hit them like a family as well. You know that this did, and the fact that she had done the stunt and then that this happened, these things unfortunately happen, and that's, that, that is a big risk with stunt people. It happened, they, they, they are risking their life every time they do these things, and the fact that this happened, it's, um, it, it's, it's, it's really, it hurts. It does because it's also again as a, as a dad. It's just, I think about her, her father. I think about all these things that that kind of happen, and it's just it's very it's very hard to kind of process it once you realize, like you said, it's for it's for entertainment for us, but it is also it was a job that she loved, and it was something that she wanted to do. And the fact that it went down this way, you know how excited she must have been to be on Deadpool two, and that this went down. It's it's terrible. 
Yeah, I, I completely agree. It's a terrible situation, and it's uh, we hear these stories from time to time. I believe it was on The Walking Dead. They recently lost a stunt yep. person on set, and production had to <laughs> shut down. And these stories are always awful when they come out because it's just a reminder that you know you see the behind the scenes stuff with crash pads and airbags and all that stuff, and you feel like oh, it's all fake. But no, like these stunt people are actually putting their lives on the line in a very real way, and it's unfortunate that it's events like this that actually remind us that that is the case. Yeah, this is this is not not the greatest thing to hear, especially after yesterday when we were talking and, you know, maybe poking a little fun at Tom Cruise's injury where, and, and we don't even know the extent of that injury if he seriously hurt himself, but, you know, whether whether it's a bump on the leg or a situation like this, if you're working in that industry, it is a major, major risk no matter what. And we don't really know a lot of the details about what specifically happened here, but I do hope that everyone involved, and I imagine with someone like David Leach and Ryan Reynolds, who I know are professionals to the max, that all safety precautions were taken in this situation. And it was just a like an out of the blue tragedy, which is a terrible, terrible thing. I feel for everybody in her life, everybody on that set. It's a really difficult thing, though, to kind of step back and really understand the fact that you know, we sit here and we talk about how much we love movies and we sit here and we'll like nitpick little things that we're excited about, that we're not excited about. People, whether you're talking about a stunt person that is very clearly putting their life on the line to create a stunt to wow us in the theater, or even just people that are saying, okay, I'll pick up and go somewhere for X amount of months, I'll leave everything behind. I mean, no matter if you're talking physically or mentally, making a movie is really taxing on someone, and it's times like this when I hope a lot of people can kind of step back and respect the fact that all these filmmakers out there, as lucky as they are to work on super cool movies, like a Deadpool movie, they're they're giving a lot up for us to have what we love so much. So if, you know, I, I feel for everybody in her life, and I'm kind of keeping that in mind right now. Yeah, her name was withheld until they were able to um, notify her family and friends. But once again, her name was Joy Harris. She went by SJ, and she was the first African-American American female professional road racer. And Deadpool 2 was a movie she was very excited to be doing. And now it's our job to make the impossible transition into the rest of the show, which we are going to be talking about our top five summer movies. And so when you look at all the summer movies that have come out, I know that not everybody thinks that 2017 was the best summer in the world of movies, but I'm pretty sure that you can come up with five, even Christian Harlow can tough. come up with it was five tough. that he really did enjoy. So what we're going to do is, we're not spending the whole show on this, but what we're going to do <laughs> is give our panelists the time to vent, to celebrate whatever movies that they truly loved. And yes, I did make everybody rank their movies. This isn't just a handful of movies that you enjoyed. you got to rank it, because unless you rank it, what's the point? Right, Perry? You're up first. Oh, that uh, was terrible. Yeah. That's what you get for stealing that was jokes. Terrible. Yeah. Yeah, take that apple little sauce, beef. applesauce needs more credit than Garbage. you give it. Um, all right, I'm prepared for this. I was prepping last night, and I know the rules. All right, so my number five is going to be Logan Lucky. I imagine that that's going to be a movie that I watch and rewatch over and over. I said it a little bit in the review that I did with Dennis. It feel it feels like um, it feels like his kind of movie where you have the Ocean's Eleven vibe to it, and whereas you find a director who gets in a groove and does this uh, typical thing over and over and over again. If they keep doing it over, they need to add something new. And Logan Lucky does feel like it has just enough where it's, it's slightly refreshing and it's got a new spin where it's still, it's still got in it what you know and love so much. I think it's the perfect blend of the two. Number four is Dunkirk. I finally got around to seeing Dunkirk and I suspected that I might react really strongly to it, and I did. I really appreciated, or actually, I came to appreciate the storytelling structure there because I know a lot of people before I went to go see it because I saw it kind of late. They're like, "Oh, well, you're not going to remember any of the characters' names. You, they barely say anything. There's no character development." The way that it was all structured and it all came together in the end made it so much more powerful to me. So it's kind of stuck in my head. I can't wait to watch and rewatch that as well. Number three is Spider-Man Homecoming. I mean, that, that to me is kind of the quintessential summer blockbuster. I had so, so much fun with that movie. I love Tom Holland as Spider-Man. Every little detail on that, I think I've seen it two or three times in the theater now, and I'm just looking at every little bit, all the color. It's just got so much energy to it. Love that one. 
to is War for the Planet of the Apes. I said it in my review as well. This is one of my favorite trilogies for one specific character I've ever seen in my life. I think War is incredible. It's not my favorite of the Apes trilogy. I still give that title to Rise, but all three of those coming together and culminating in the events of war really, really was just the perfect wrap up for Caesar and and whatever his arc is gonna be within the context of this Matt Reeves trilogy. I am I'm so satisfied by where that movie left me off with these characters. And again, I'm gonna watch that movie over and over. I'm gonna watch one, two, cause that's what I did. I watched Rise, Dawn, and then I went to my war screening. Wow, is that effective. And so that is your five through two. Yes. And then we have your number one, which my we're number just going to go ahead and We're going to go it. ahead and do it. My number one is Baby Driver. Baby Driver. You shocked me just now. Really? <laughs> you oh, shocked me just you now. Oh, because you were waiting I was, I was ready, to I was ready to go, what a wonderful bomb. list. And, yeah, oh, okay. great. Okay. I, I will was tell Baby you. Driver your applesauce, Christian? No, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> she, she just won me back over. I will tell you that, that Guardians was kind of, like, I, I made a whole list of everything I saw. It was floating in, a, right. in an honorable mention type zone there. Perry's but, apartment is kind of like a beautiful mind <laughs> with this list. Like, there's just, like, yeah. charts and graphs and all over the no, place. No, that's only for my box office predictions. Which you did. Very well. <laughs> Thank you. Mm-hmm. I, d- I went five for five last week, but not to derail the conversation. Uh, Baby Driver is my favorite movie of the year. Most of these movies on here, really all of them, are rewatchable where I think you can watch them over and over again and get a new level of entertainment or a new level of detail every single time you watch it. Baby Driver is, it's like, it's like when you create the perfect playlist and you're just driving around and you could repeat that playlist over and over and over again. I'm still just completely amazed by how well that action is coordinated with with the story with baby's journey and the music the fact that every single thing he does in that car is so perfectly timed to the beat of that soundtrack is just incredible to me i think it's a beautiful character arc and it left me feeling more moved than i ever could have expected that's a pretty damn good list there perry nemroff i want you to take that imaginary baton and pass it over to your left to t because now it is time for t's top five movies of the summer well, this is your friendly neighborhood hipster douchebag checking in, <laughs> and uh, I'm going to start off with a bit of a cheat because this is not this is actually not out until the 25th. But Terminator 2 and 3D, I don't know if it's going to be good in 3D. I'm going to level with you. I don't know, but it's still Terminator 2, and by God, that's one of my top three movies or top five of all time. So I'm going to see it. Hopefully, it's not. Like all fucked up from the 3D, we'll see. Skating by on a technicality yeah. is T. I'm reaching here, T. I'm cheating. Reaching. I'm cheating. Look, it was it was a slim pickings kind of summer <laughs> for was. me. I'm gonna be honest. <laughs> Number four for me, I got some crossover with Perry. War for Planet of the Apes. Uh, for the, War for the Planet of the Apes. I really <laughs> uh, enjoyed that movie. It was not my favorite of the trilogy. That would still be Dawn. Dawn. Yeah, the second one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I always get that mix up because Dawn should come before Rise, but that's another conversation. <laughs> but, uh, you know, even though I feel like it's slightly under-delivered on the whole war portion of that title, I still think it was a pretty well-constructed movie and a very nice way to end that trilogy arc for Caesar's character. Number three is a indie movie called Brigsby Bear, which is now in limited mm-hmm. release. It's one of my favorite movies of the year, not just of the summer. I feel like it's a truly heartwarming, unique, fresh film that people really need to check out. I feel like it's not being talked about enough, and I hope that it gets a little bit more word of mouth buzz uh, in the coming weeks now that it's actually accessible to people, because I saw it back in January at Sundance, and it's one of the most memorable films out of the delirium I was in when I was there, seeing I think something like 12 movies over four days. Um, number two for me is is Girls Trip, which was a surprise because I did not expect to even want to see that movie in the first place, let alone to like it as much as I did. 100% of that credit goes to Tiffany Haddish because she was simply the breakout performance in that film. I cannot wait to see what else she does. I've been a fan of hers from The Carmichael Show, so it's nice to see her getting so much recognition for her performance in this film as well. And the number one for me is going to be a movie that I've also been talking about since January when I saw it at Sundance, and that's Wind River which is the directorial debut of Taylor Sheridan. He is the writer Mm -hmm. of Sicario, and he also wrote Hell or High Water, which is probably in my number one or number two spot of movies from 2016. Cannot wait to see what he does next. He is absolutely a filmmaker where I am all in any project he does from here on out. 
All right. So, Christian, how can you possibly top those two? We got some different movies on there. It's not just the same yeah, time. No, I don't think I'm going to be able to top it because this is the, the first summer that I've actually missed a few of those movies that I think that had I seen them could be in there, like Briggsby Bear is something I wanted to see, Wind River, absolutely. Dunkirk, I still haven't seen. I know I get that tweet every day. I've seen it. I'm planning on seeing it very soon. Nut Job uh, 2. Girls Night's another one. Well, my top five are <laughs> Nut Job 2, Emoji Movie, The Mummy, uh, Baywatch. Uh, Baywatch. Uh, yeah, those are all. That, that's that's the kind of summer we were dealing with, kids. Uh, it wasn't great. But uh, look, I, 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 and I went against you like like in late June. You were already like just Same like you were walking around the office just like a dark cloud of rainy doom yeah. about the rest of the summer. And I was like, dude, give it a chance. We did get some good movies, but I think I do have to agree with you. This summer was a let bit of a you, letdown. Let me tell you how bad this summer was. And I know a lot of people like this movie. Just saying, coming from my personal taste, I almost put, almost put Annabelle in my top five. Wow. Five. Because it, I again, I missed Dunkirk. I missed movie. Girls' Night. I missed it. It was for what the movie was, it was, but I'm just not, as we know, the horror aficionado. So, um, but I did not put it there. I actually went and put Alien Covenant in there Good at man. number five. Um, I thought that it did its job as far as what an Alien movie did. Was it was it anything brand new? No. It was a little bit paint by numbers, but I got to see what I didn't get in Prometheus. And I got to see um, just, you know, people getting picked off left and right by aliens, and I, I left satisfied enough, plus the fact I haven't seen Dunkirk. Um, number four, <laughs> I put Wonder Woman in there. I think Wonder Woman was a movie that I was, I, I was hesitant about because I, you know... It, I, I bought into some of the DC rumors, the fact that they can't get this thing together, they can't get the DC universe, and I was wrong. I was completely wrong because Patty Jenkins did an incredible job. I went in optimistic, and I left even more optimistic. I left optimistic about the DCEU. I left optimistic about Gal Gadot as Wonder Woman, about them leading with her. I thought that it had a very important message, and I thought that that message was carried over. It proved a lot of things, proved a lot of people wrong to where they certain things. I remember even working in Warner Brothers back in the day, and people were hesitant about having a female that superhero movie and boy were they wrong because it even surpassed Guardians of the Galaxy 2 um, and then <laughs> number three I'm actually going to have War for Planet of the Apes I'm also putting that in there I love the Apes series I agree with T it's also my third favorite out of the three but I still think that it did exactly what it needed to do and it told the story it pitched you on war for the planet of the apes but it was more than that it was it was it was a kind of a personal smaller story that some people weren't prepared for and thought oh this isn't the war movie i expected i actually like to see that thing what was developing there for caesar and what the that, that's what this movie's always been about it's about caesar and developing him and understanding what he had to go through as a leader and that really came to came to be in this particular film and i, I liked it i liked what matt reeves did i thought it was a nice bow for the entire thing uh number two i'm gonna put spider-man homecoming I thought Spider-Man Homecoming was the best Spider-Man movie we ever have. And I know that there's a lot of Ooh. people that, that Spider-Man 2 um, is, is up there for people. And I think that nostalgia might play in there. And it also, I think Sam Raimi did a great job for that movie. But I thought that this movie, Spider-Man Homecoming, nailed the character of Spider-Man like we've never seen before. I thought there were so many moments in this movie that I can just list off. I've seen the movie once, and I can tell you how memorable it was. I remember the the, the monument scene, the party scene, the, the scene where he's he, he's in the rubble, the stuff that Michael Keaton did. It is a very memorable uh, Spider-Man film, superhero film. It had a great Marvel villain, um, and I think that it just did the job right. But number one, I'm tying with Perry here. Baby Driver is my favorite movie of the year, not just summer. I thought it um, the, the use of music, the it, it was it was fresh, it was different, and it, it it did have that kind of nice nice guys feel to it. But it was I think it was more successful in Nice Guys because it just resonated with people more. I thought there were great performances by Ansel Edgord and John Hamm, um, Kevin Spacey. There was so much done right in this movie. Lily James was fantastic. So um, I love this movie. I cannot wait for it to come out on Blu-ray because it'll be something that I own immediately. Very well presented that. Alien Covenant pick very controversial in the chat room right yeah, now. Yeah, I know. Um, I know. There was nothing else to pick. <laughs> it's been fun to follow along with you guys in the chat, so make sure when you guys comment on YouTube, give us your top five. Give us what your number five through number one is. I want to quickly throw it over to the news desk. Ashley Mova and Wendy Lee, did you guys get a chance to check out these kind of movies? What is your top five? Yes, I've actually got a top three because I don't get screenings. I got to spend my pennies on these movies. Get and, movie pass. You know, <laughs> and what? Get movie pass. <laughs> I'm gonna get Movie Pass ten dollars a month. That's yes. a good deal. Mm -hmm. anyway, now so they're I've not got, a sponsor. <laughs> I've got a top three. I'm gonna do honor mention, honorable mention for number four actually because it is very rare to hear 
a positive thing about horror movies sometimes in this office. And for Christian to say that you liked it, did you say that you liked it? Yeah, I thought it was it was it was a well made film. It was very it was. He same. hated yeah. being in the theater. I was sitting next to him, but he did appreciate, I appreciate the craftsmanship it. that went into. But he hated being in the theater. I, I thought it was very well directed. <laughs> I just thought it was the same horror movie I've seen a billion times. No, it was. Oh, well, we'll leave it. It was very well directed. You're so I'm really well, excited to see that, and I'll probably see that this weekend. So I'm going to throw that in there. But uh, number three for me is Girls Trip because I at first wasn't going to see it because I thought it was just going to be a bunch of like dick jokes, which don't like, I, I love a good dick joke. Like, let's be real here. <laughs> but um, Mark saw it and he said that he really liked it and it was actually really funny. So I really enjoyed that. And it's been a while since we've seen a great comedy and I love laughing at the movies. Uh, number two for me was actually an, another one that kind of took me by surprise is Wonder Woman because I thought it was going to be so overhyped and everyone was just excited about it. And here's another superhero movie that everyone loves, but I watched it and I really freaking loved it and Gal Gadot props to her like everyone was talking shit about her and she really proved so many people wrong and my number one is Spider-Man Homecoming because I loved Andrew Garfield as Spider-Man Spider-Man's my favorite superhero and I loved Andrew Garfield as Spider-Man and it was really sad to see him leave and I kind of had my doubts about this new Spider-Man but he proved me wrong and I'm really excited to see more Spider-Man movies now all right, and now Wendy Lee, did you get a chance to see three movies? You want to do a top three? You think in top five? I got top five, so here we go. Um, so my top five is actually Dunkirk. I know when you and I did the review, Mark, I didn't give it the perfect mark that everybody wanted me to give, but I'm going to always be honest. Mm -hmm. But I can also acknowledge fantastic filmmaking when I see it. And uh, Nolan, as always, is fantastic what he does and is the, like one of the best cinematography I've seen all year. And number four for me is Wonder Woman. I left the movie feeling super empowered. I want to be Wonder Woman in real life. Yeah. Number three for me, it is Spider-Man Homecoming, Tom Holland, Zendaya, everybody. Fan it's, it may be my favorite Spider-Man movie out of everything we've seen, it, with the exception of Spider-Man 2, which was also mm -hmm. awesome. Uh, all right, number two is War for the Planet of the Apes. It is... I think this trilogy, honestly, it's it's almost coming up to like how much I love Lord of the Rings trilogy. It's it's almost to that level. And the number one for me, Baby Driver, so good. Yeah, Baby Driver is going to top a lot of lists. And now the moment you've all been waiting for, <coughs> my list. No, no, no. no. Hold your applause, guys. Uh, there are some honorable mentions and some movies that like Christian and everybody else here. I did not get a chance to see Baywatch or the Emoji Movie, or the Nut Job 2, so maybe they would have made the list. My apologies to you. And I also just feel really bad about some of the movies I'm leaving out of my honorable mentions, like It Comes at Night. Sorry. Yeah. It Comes at Night. I just could not get it in the top five, but such an impressive feat to overcome not only the obstacles that any independent filmmaker has, but also to overcome the fact that the studio was selling us a different movie. We went in there expecting something totally different, and we still got a very emotional production. I will say Girls Trip was probably the funniest movie that I've seen in a long time. And by the way, my bud Tiffany Haddish has a special on Showtime this Friday at 9 p.m., August 18th, so make sure you check that out. And I, uh, man, it really hurts not being able to get the big sick in the top five, because the big sick is, it's, it's a work and it's an achievement by Kumail and Judd Apatow and everybody involved in that. And it's based on a true story. So make sure you guys check out The Big Sick. My number five is Dunkirk. It's just such a visceral war experience where there's not a lot of character development. And I think not only was that... Uh, helpful and instrumental in telling us what the story is, but I think that was done on purpose because you're just thrown on a beach with a bunch of people you don't know, and the key is survival. At number four is Spider-Man Homecoming. It's just... What do you want me to say about it, man? It's fun. It's maybe the most fun I've had at the movies in a long time, but it could not supersede the fun I had with Baby Driver. That soundtrack is just so good. I just enjoyed Edgar Wright's filmmaking. Start to finish, so many great characters <laughs> weaving their way in and out of that storyline, and Ansel Elgort, that kid, proved himself to be a star. War for the Planet of the Apes is my number two. Just such a great close to a great trilogy. And I don't want to talk about how, yeah, it was a great trilogy and this one did its job. This thing maybe impacted me emotionally more than any of the other two movies. And that's saying something that we didn't get maybe as much war as we wanted to, but everything else in that film just felt so real and impactful to me. At number one 
is Wonder Woman. I think it's the best movie of the summer for a myriad of different reasons that I go to the movies to be entertained. And I think what this movie speaks from a progressive standpoint, but also from a DCU standpoint, I love all those comic book characters. I want to see them in great movies. I think Wonder Woman is the best movie we've had in that universe by a mile. And I think that this movie pretends to such a great future for the DCU, for female superheroes, for directors, for so many things. I just think Wonder Woman is is the most fun I had of the movies this year. That's why it's my number one. I'll wait until you guys are stopped clapping. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, well, hey, we didn't save any room on any of our list for movies opening this week. However, Hitman's Bodyguard is out, so Ashley, tell me about it. The world's top protection agent is called upon to guard the, li the life of his mortal enemy, one of the world's most notorious hitmen. During their journey from England to The Hague, they encounter high-speed car chases, outlandish boat escapades, and a merciless Eastern European dictator who is out for blood. Yeah, I mean, I, I love a good buddy cop movie. I, I grew up on them. I remember staying up late until my parents fell asleep so I could sneak downstairs and try to tape Beverly Hills Cop 2 on Showtime because I wasn't allowed to watch it. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. I love the lethal weapons and stuff like that. And Christian, we're hoping to get that vibe from Hitman's Bodyguard. I think it's probably going to have some good chuckles in it. I think that the action and the story are going to unnecessarily bludgeon us with a bunch of ridiculousness that we don't need. Yeah, I don't have much faith in it. I like both Sam Jackson and Ryan Reynolds. The mm -hmm. problem is it's kind of buried in August already. Haven't heard any buzz on it. And... Um, Ryan Reynolds hasn't had great success outside of, say, Deadpool mm -hmm. and maybe a handful of other things. So, You didn't like Just Friends? All no, right. I did not. <laughs> One of the few. T, what do you think about the Hitman's Bodyguard? Uh, I, I am not excited about this at all. I looked at the trailer and I just said hard pass. It just looks tired. It looks really tired to me. It seems like it's really self-indulgent. It seems like Ryan Reynolds and Samuel L. Jackson are just kind of playing themselves. And it just seems like rich rich Hollywood guys like playing fantasy hitmen. Uh, you know what I mean? And they just happen to roll cameras. I don't know. I'm just not interested. Perry, what do you think about rich Hollywood guys? Are you I, taking this movie? Yeah. I'm, I'm seeing it tonight, so I'm kind of looking forward to it. I'll see anything with Sam Jackson in it. Anything <laughs> at all. He's but, in everything, so you probably know, have seen everything. Yeah, I'm that's just going to watch Snakes on a Plane again, personally. <laughs> I wouldn't mind watching that again as well, but I'm kind of looking forward to it. I mean, watching the trailers, you can tell that it's probably a tired concept. The jokes are going to be hit or miss, but... You know, as long as it's got enough momentum and I have some fun with it, fine by me. You and a great Samuel L. Jackson performance coming to America. Blinking, you'll miss him, but he's yeah. in there and he's holding up Louis Anderson. It's one of his first roles, I think. That's oh, absolutely yeah. correct. All right, let's move on to buy or sell. Ashley's going to give us a premise. We'll say whether we buy it or sell it, and you guys will enjoy it, hopefully. <laughs> Variety is reporting that Anya Taylor-Joy, the breakout star from The Witch and this past January <coughs> split, is in talks to re-team with her witch director, Robert Eggers, for a new take on the cinematic classic Nosferatu. To. Eggers is writing and directing the movie, which will be based on the 1922 silent movie that followed the vampire Count Orlock of Transylvania, who wants to buy a house in Germany and becomes enamored by the real estate agent's wife. A release date for the movie has not been set. Perry Byersell, Anya Taylor-Joy, and Robert Eggers' remake of Nosferatu. I am going to buy this big time. I will pretty much buy just about anything that Anya Taylor-Joy is cast in. That's not the concern here at all. But the idea of remaking Nosferatu is mildly alarming. But if anybody else was doing it other than Robert Eggers, I think I would be a little more nervous than I am now. You know, I'm not going to go ahead and say, oh, because he directed The Witch. He's got this. It's going to be great, and it's going to be a worthwhile remake. But I remember when The Witch came out, I did an interview with him and Anya, and I was asking him about it. And the quotes he gave me, he basically said that, I think the way I phrased the question was, why is Nosferatu going to be your next movie? He goes, well, like, hold, hold on a second. It's not going to be my next one. I'm not going to tell you that I'm not interested in doing it and that it won't happen, but it, it seems... It seems like a big leap to go from your first feature as a director to remaking a movie that is that iconic. So the fact that he understood that, and then I was asking him a little bit about, you know, would you ever remake it as a silent film? That could, you know, make it a little different, not from what you're, you're adapting, but from the general climate of remakes right now. And he said, you know, why, the, the reason 
it's a cool idea. The reason why I wouldn't do that is because we already have a great silent version of that story. So it just seems like the way he was processing all of that at the time was him being on the right track. So I do have a lot of faith in the project. So I have my hope, my hopes pretty high that it's going to come together well. Yeah, I'd like there to be words in this version, <laughs> uh, spoken words. And this is a huge buy for me. I think Robert Eggers has so much talent. And what we saw in The Witch is just scratching the surface, in my humble opinion. And obviously, Anya Taylor-Joy, she, I mean, Robert Eggers had wanted her for this project for a while. And after Split, her schedule just blew up. I mean, she's got New Mutants. She has a lot of things on her plate but I think that if you set aside some time to make this movie going back to Studio 8 which Robert Eggers has a very good relationship with I think he's working on the night with them right now this is going to be something special because of what he did with The Witch I think there's a lot of potential for this kind of project you yeah it's a big buy for me because of the team up for sure and I'm okay with a remake for exactly the reasons that he gave you was that if they were remaking the silent version trying to do what Gus Van Zandt did with Psycho you know shot mm -hmm. by shot same thing like, why, why are you doing that? That's, we have that already. This, we don't have this version. Uh, we, he's gonna, we're going to get his take on it, plus the fact it's been a very long time. It's not like somebody's like trying to remake The Godfather right now. This is a long time. It's a, it's a classic. There's no doubt about it. But I also think there's a lot of people who probably haven't seen the original Nosferatu. So to get his take on it, we'll probably get that story out there to a lot more people that were fans of The Witch, are fans of, of her and his, and, and could get a lot of people in the theater to see this. And because of the smaller budget nature of it, I think it could be something pretty special and something that I would, if turned out right, put in my top five and want to put in there. Oh, good, as opposed to being grumpy during That's Annabelle absolutely with a lot of right. heavy breathing That's and sighing. Right. That's right, because it wouldn't be the same thing. That's what my point is. It's not the same kind of cliches that we see over and over and over again. This would be something different, like The Witch was. Sure, yeah. I mean, they, they touched on the, the, the legacy of Nosferatu, but more from a filmmaking standpoint, where they think it was Shadow of the Vampire with Willem Dafoe, yes. but this would yes. really be an adventure back into the story Storyline that that movie had way back in the 1920s. T, you on board with this? I would absolutely buy this. I think, you know, Anya Taylor Joy is sort of becoming the horror thriller darling. Mm -hmm. You know, most of her choices are sort of in that realm, and I feel like she's definitely building a lot of street cred there. As far as the director, Eggers, I think a lot of the things that he was telling Perry in that interview give me confidence in him because it seems like he was approaching the property with a lot of respect and just sort of making sure to honor the original version while still doing something something different and fresh. And I think that is the absolute way that you need to approach any sort of remake instead of doing, say, a shot for a shot. We're just going to do it in color with different actors right. type of situation like they did with Psycho. All right, let's move on to our last buy or sell. What is Rememory? Lionsgate premiere has released the first Rememory trailer online. Directed by Mark Polanski, the film revolves around the mysterious death of a scientific pioneer who creates technology that allows you to extract memories and watch them on an external device. Peter Dinklage plays a man who shows up and tries to solve the murder using this memory machine, which allows him to watch memories from other people as well. As the investigation continues, a web of intrigue and deceit is uncovered. The film also stars Julia Orman, Martin Donovan, Anton Yelchin, Henry Ian Cusick, and Evelyn Brochu, and hits theaters on September 8th. T. Buyer saw the first trailer for Rememory. I'm going to buy it. It was giving me big time Black Mirror episode vibes, but sort of fleshed out into a full sized feature. Love Peter Dinklage, obviously, and I love a thriller preferably sexual. But in this case, I feel like it's got a cool concept, it's got a great cast, and I really just want to see where this goes. I'm T, and I prefer sex with my thrillers. Um, I think this has a lot of likability in this trailer because, yeah, it feels Black Mirror all over. And one of my favorite episodes of Black Mirror, my favorite episode I still think is, for whatever reason, The Politician and the Pig. Like, like I, this is my favorite one. But the one with Toby Kebbell where, like, you can store your memories on this little contact lens and you can watch them anytime you want, that's really interesting. And so to go further into that, hopefully it's not a paint-by-numbers remake or rehashing of that, but it's also something new and fresh. Peter Dinklage is just, I love like seeing him get an opportunity to be a leading man like this because I think he's going to crush it, Christian. Um, I buy it, and I also I see your Black Mirror, and I raise you Strange Days by Catherine Bigelow. <laughs> um, Throwback. I, it, it, it reminds me of, of that because I was kind of in the realm of this technology that is that is formed, but then there's this thriller behind it and this murder mystery that you have to figure out, and that's what this is. Now, as I was watching it and I was intrigued, 
I was wondering if I would have cared if it wasn't Peter Dinklage in the role. Because I was mm. like, well, if this was just kind of like a Netflix ad that I saw, I'd be like, oh, it could be all right. But I think I'm more intrigued now because Peter Dinklage is in the role to see what he's going to bring to it. It's still an interesting premise all the way around, but I think there's something special that he brings to the role. Um, so because of that and because of the idea of this kind of science fiction fantasy, the, the idea of being able to see other people's memories is always fun to see how it's executed. So I'll buy it. There's been a lot of buying here at the table today, Perry. Why are we wrong? I'm going to continue with that trend oh, and I'm going to buy it as well. I love this trailer. And it's actually an interesting point to bring up to try to imagine it without Peter Dinklage. He definitely brings something extra to it where that's going to draw a bigger audience. It's yeah. going to draw on the Game of Thrones audience that might not have sought something like this out. I think I would be intrigued no matter what, though. I love these kinds of ideas. I love Black Mirror. That is also my favorite episode, one, because of Toby Kebbell, but <laughs> two, because I really like those kinds of ideas. As crazy and horrific as it sounds, the, like the thought of like chips being implanted in your head and being able to visualize memories. I am just endlessly fascinated by all of this. So the fact that it's it's a murder mystery woven into all that is just super interesting to me. And also, this is an exceptionally well cut trailer. That score, the way that all they lay all the pieces out and then they build and then you get all those really like heightened tense scenes at the end. I mean, this is a perfect example of a trailer that leaves you desperate to know how all this pans out. Let's get into personal entomology for just a second. Christian, you're starting. If you had a device where you could record all your memories and store them somewhere, are you taking that or do you have some reservations? <sighs> taking it 100%. Because you're a dad? No, well, no one else is going to see them, but I'm, Steph, I'm absolutely... They could. Peter what? Dinklage is watching other people's memories. Well, you're saying if I can have it from myself? Yeah, but yeah, I mean, it, it could fall into the wrong hands. Well, then that's my fault. Okay, good. Yeah. Nobody wants to see your stupid memories. Well, it's still <laughs> applesauce memories. <laughs> Perry Nemiroff, you taking this thing? Do you even have to ask me that question? I sleep with my cell phone in my bed. I don't ever want to disconnect. I love this kind of stuff. Yeah. Mm, I'm, I'm, I, I kind of like memories being memories. How about you, T? I am the opposite of Perry. I don't even <laughs> sleep with my cell phone in the same room. I will jump out a window if that becomes a possibility. <laughs> yeah, I charge my phone in the kitchen, then I go in the bedroom, then I wake up at like 5 a.m., yeah. then I go out, get some water, grab the phone to wake I me up. I think you guys are wrong, though. I think you're both, uh, not, I think you're not wrong, but I think that you guys would second guess it when you start to think there are certain things that are scary about it. There's no doubt about it, but there are certain things that in your past that you don't want to see memories of for sure, <laughs> but there are also things and people that you might want to revisit and people that are not around anymore and those types of things and memories that you'd want to, I think, be able to revisit. It's I'm, more I'm an analog kind of life. girl. No? Like, analog all the way. All right. If I, like, like going forward, I just don't think there's going to be any anything exciting in my life. There's memories I'd like to relive, yeah. but as of this moment going forward, not a whole lot left for old Mark Ellis. All right, let's move on to Collider's Mailbag. But before we get to that, I want to remind you guys that this is not the only show that we have on Collider Video's YouTube channel. We actually have a lot of cool Schmodown stuff coming up. For that, we go to our man, Christian Harlock. Well, we're doing the tournament. We're going to have two tournaments coming up. The team tournament, which you see right there, and the singles tournament. But the team tournament, myself, Ken Knapsack, and John Roker are going to break down the tournament. But for you guys, as we do every year, we submit brackets. You guys submit brackets, and the first person to submit a successful bracket, a perfect bracket, will win a pretty nice prize that will be um, announced later on as the tournament's going on. But in order to find out where to submit that bracket, watch today's special. The email will be revealed, so check that out. It drops at 2 p.m. today for that bracket. That Ultimate Showdown logo is clean. It's great, right? That's yeah, nice that's Ray. That's Ray Aura. Well done, Bri uh, Aura. Yeah, and we also had um, our, our buddy... Um, uh, Brian, Brian Ward. Ward. Thank you. Brian Ward did a bunch of them, too, that I will be releasing that as some promotional pieces. Very cool. Well, we also have some more daily content for you guys. TV Talk and Heroes is now daily. Hey, look, it's a mailbag question. <laughs> That's what we call <laughs> foreshadowing in the business. It's a memory. It's a memory. Check Someone out TV Talk there. Live later on today, as well as an all-new episode of Heroes Plus Comic Book Shopping with John Schnapp. A new episode of that is going to be dropping tomorrow. And, of course, last but not least, Awesome Tacular, starring our buddy Jeremy Johns on the Go90 Network every Friday. You guys can get the link to the latest vid in this description right here. And we're chopping at the bit to show you guys this first letter in Collider Mailbag. What do we got, Ashley? <laughs> Hector writes, greetings from Spain, Collider crew. My question is regarding Baby Driver's Oscar chances. Last year, my favorite movie was Shane Black's The Nice Guys. I really thought it could get a Best Original Screenplay nom, and it got nothing. I'm worried that Baby Driver will get no awards recognition from the Academy this year, and I think it really should. It's my favorite movie as of right now. What do you guys think? Should it get any Oscars? Best director for Edgar Wright. Best original screenplay. Thank you for taking my question. You gals and guys rock. 
Well, Hector, I think both of those award nominations are in play for Baby Driver as of right now. I mean, you saw how we feel about the movie, keeping it so high in a lot of people's list. Christian, you love this movie. Is it going to be a contender come Oscar time? Should it be? Yes. Will it be? No. I don't think the Academy is going to recognize it for uh, for what it is. Th Best Director, for sure, I think Edgar Wright should be nominated for the, what he does, the way he shoots it, his use of music, uh, the performances he got out of his actors. As far as the screenplay, yes, I think that should be nominated. I think that the movie should be nominated for a ton of stuff, but I just can't see the Academy doing it. I think there'll be a lot more, either more, more films will come out towards, God bless you, September and maybe by the end of December that will, uh, that will probably overshadow it, which shouldn't, but I don't see it happening, and I hope it does. I will remind you that we do get 10 movies that could be nominated for Best Picture, and, and this fall season has to come to play ball. If not, but it, that, isn't I that think what Baby Driver could sneak in there. But that happens all the well, time. Well, I don't think it, it should have like... happened with the nice guys. I, I, I think a lot of people liked it. I thought it was good, but I didn't think it was no, no, no. What I mean level. Is, I think Baby Driver could be. What I mean is that the summer movies, last year's summer was way better than this year, but even then, it was like, yeah, there's nothing really out there that's going to be nominated, and then you get that influx of just all these movies that boom, 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 boom. Those are all your Oscar movies. That's, that's the way it's planned out. All the potential movies that you've seen already at, at the festivals will be released in September, October, November because they know that's when the push is for the Oscar and I think a movie like Baby Driver and Logan and movies like that will be overshadowed. Uh, Logan could be another Best Picture contender as of right now. T, uh, you were kind enough to remind us in the pre-production meeting that you cannot nominate a movie <laughs> for Best Soundtrack, <laughs> otherwise Kenny Loggins would just have a shelf full right? of Oscars. Do you think Baby Randy Driver Newman. has a chance in like a director, screenplay, Best Picture? I really don't. I think it's going to get overshadowed once Oscar season begins mm. and we're going to get inundated with those period pieces and, you know, men in wigs and things like that. So <laughs> I, I just I don't see it happening. I know there's a lot of enthusiasm for Baby Driver now, but the industry has the memory of a goldfish and we see this happen every year. I mean, it even happened with a movie I already mentioned today, Sicario, that was getting a ton of buzz and it mm -hmm. came out just a little too early and it completely missed the boat on yeah. all nominations except for maybe one or two smaller categories. Perry, have some optimism. I wish I could. I, If I were nominating Academy Award options, I would, per, I would put it in every single category that we just named. I just don't think it's gonna happen. Timing is really important. Either you come, you hit theaters too early and then people forget about you when when, when it comes time for festivals like Telluride, TIFF, all these festivals that we're about to hit right now, all of a sudden this best of the year conversation is going to start to shift towards those. Then there's also the possibility that a movie comes out too late and the first thing that comes to mind with that is a monster calls. I feel like we were mm -hmm. already so busy talking about so many other movies that that came out and there was no time to even consider it. Same thing with Silence. So I feel like it needs to hit the sweet spot, although I will say that I think it was a very smart move for Baby Driver to hit theaters when it did because it made good money. People are not going to forget it just because it didn't get nominated for an Academy Award, and it'll bring more opportunity to uh, Edgar Wright's store. That's right. I'm telling you, man, I, I think between Logan or Baby Driver, maybe even Dunkirk, I think you could see one of those movies nominated for Best Picture. Get out. I, I, oh, sit, I, on, uh, I sit on... I uh, sit on... Uh, award circuit and gold derby every once in a while just to get a sense of early predictions and I'll say get outs on a lot of lists. Okay, we well, appreciate I'll your keep research. My fingers crossed. <laughs> we need you to turn your cell phone off Apple and sauce. go to bed. Applesauce. <laughs> All right, let's move on to live Twitter questions. We are going to take some of your live ones as we do each and every day at Collider Video. Wendy Lee is our gatekeeper. Wendy, what's up first? Well, a lot of people are actually asking about the movie pass since they've dropped in uh, their subscription fees. So, Luis Rivera wants to know movie pass is dropping subscription fees to $10 a month. Is this great news for the movie theaters, and what are your pros and cons? Um, I mean, look, uh, pros and cons are simple. Like, it's a service that I think you need to investigate if you want to spend your money that way. Lowering it is always a good idea. Um, so, you know, movie pass, it, it seems like another way to get people out to the movies. So, if it's encouraging in that vein, then I think it's pretty cool. T? I think it's an impossibly great deal. I feel like it's going to be too good to last. It's great for movie fans, but I don't see it as a sustainable business model for people to be able to see unlimited movies. You could see a movie every day for a month for 10 bucks. That's outrageous. I mean, if you go once, it's already paid for itself. And I just don't see how theaters are going to be able to sustain that. Perry, Applesauce, Nemiroff. Uh, yeah, I would say the same exact thing unless this is a service that kind of boxes you into a certain a certain uh, type of movie at a certain time of day where they know they're not going to fill seats anyway. 
Annabelle Champion Christian. It's unless they make some kind of deal the way Netflix makes with studios to where they, you know, Netflix basically is, what, 10, 12 bucks a month, and you can get all these movies and everything, too. Now, granted, they're not new releases, so maybe that if there's some kind of deal they're making, they're paying a lot of money to the theater chains and studios, and then we benefit from it. But I agree with T. I don't think that it, they're going to be able to do it for this long. It'll probably, they'll get everybody to sign up, and then they go, oh, wait, look, now it's 25 bucks. You like the service, right? It's worth it. The <laughs> old bait and switch. Yeah. Remember Columbia House, 13 CDs for one penny. Yep, exactly Don't ask what, what the 14 is. CD cost you. Why am I getting no. billed for $80 a month now? <laughs> All right, let's do one more and call today. Okay, this one comes from Stephen Grant, who writes, Can you see a movie coming out in the next five to ten years that will be followed and as loved as Star Wars after 40 years? Nope. Uh, that is pretty impossible to do. I, I think that people always want to know what the next big thing uh, could potentially be. And I think you're going to have movies that come out that are beloved and celebrated for decades and generations to come. But I just think for a confluence of so many different events, not the least of which the time period it came out in, the effects revolution, the summer blockbuster revolution, the storytelling, the mythology involved, I, you're never going to see another Star Wars. Sorry. Well, it's just the thing is, is it's it's what you just said. The landscape of what theater uh, movies was back then was completely different, and what the landscape was in the '70s was completely different. The the way that they, that movies were just being presented, as far as it wasn't an optimistic feel when you went in there, it was stuff like Chinatown and things movies that were coming out in the theater, and Star Wars was the first. So it's not a matter, even if I might think it's one of the best franchises of all time, oh, it's not it a is. matter of being the best. It's a matter of being the first. And in order to be the first first uh, film franchise or film to do that and change the game, and listen to all the directors and filmmakers out there that that are that say, Star Wars inspired me. And not just because they're big fantasy sci-fi people, it's because of what it did and the way it changed filmmaking in general. So I don't see a, a, another, because, because of that, and the way that the landscape has changed, it's so different. Unless some kind of movie comes in, changes the entire landscape with like VR or something, and in maybe 10, 20 years, some kind of VR franchise changes the entire way we watch movies, that's a possibility. But the way that it is, the way the medium is now, no, I just don't. It's just different. They were the first. Man, you really love Star Wars. You should do a show about it. You're Dean, right. Do you think we could ever see another Star Wars? Uh, I agree with you guys. I think that was a one -er. I don't think there's ever going to be another Star Wars. And this is coming from someone who, I'm not even a Star Wars guy. I would have been the one in the Chinatown theater watching that instead. <laughs> uh, I like to be depressed. But I don't think that there's ever going to be another franchise that transcends generations in the way Star Wars has and then continues to inspire people to become movie fans, to even get into filmmaking in the way that Star Wars has. I can objectively say it is probably the biggest movie property that ever has been and ever will be. Uh, Perry, you've recovered from your Star Trek illness and now you're wearing your <laughs> Star Wars hat yeah. again. Do you ever see anything coming close? I am not going to say it's going to be easy, but I'm going to take the optimistic approach to this and assume that, you know, this is an industry where everybody is trying to innovate, do something different, strike a chord with moviegoers in a new way. I think maybe not in five years, but down the line for sure. There is going to be something along the lines of another Star Wars. I'm not not necessarily saying a, a sci-fi space adventure movie or anything specifically like that. I think it really is only a matter of time before something else comes out that captures just like the widest possible viewership and it really and it really does change lives. All right. Well, thank you for Star Wars for all you did. We appreciate it. All right, that's it for today's episode of Collider Movie Talk. Thank you guys for watching the show and participating in the chat room and the comment section. Once again, tell us your top five summer movies as it stands here today. I want to thank our panel up here with me. First of all, T, where can the kids check you out? As always, you guys can find me right here on YouTube on my personal channel, which is called Nappy Headed Jojoba. Hopefully there's a lower third that tells you how to spell that, because otherwise, good luck. And if not, you can find me talking about movies over on Cinefix. Perry, when you're not making sauces out of fruits, where can the kids check you out? <laughs> Don't you know I can't make anything? <laughs> um, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at PNMROF. Also, keep an eye out for the new episode of Collider Behind the Scenes and Bloopers this Saturday, 2 p.m. PST. Christian Harloff, the OG when it comes to applesauce. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Christian Harloff, Twitter, Instagram, Jedi Council every Thursday. And like we mentioned before, make sure you want to get those brackets in and a chance to win some prizes. Go and watch the special today, the Ultimate Schmodown Breakdown for the team tournament at 2 p.m. PST. Way over there on the news desk, Ashley.
Ashley Mova. You guys can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, Ashley Mova. Happy Tuesday, guys. And our Twitter gatekeeper, last but not least, Miss Wendy Lee Zaney. You can find me on YouTube at the Movie Couple channel and at Wendy Lee Zaney on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. I am merely Mark Ellis. Thank you guys so much for watching today. Subscribe right here to Collider Video for upcoming stand updates, including Las Vegas, Philly, and New York. Go to markellislive.com. We'll see you guys right back here tomorrow. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.